The difference between those two prices is called the spread. The difference between those two prices is called the spread. So the minimum spread I'm ever going to make buying and selling corporate or muni bonds is an eighth. What would be my minimum spread if I were trading government securities, T notes and T bonds? What then would be my minimum spread? Here it's an eighth, but if it was a T note or T bond, what would be my minimum spread? Thirty seconds. Right on, right on, right. So corporate communities trade in eights, and treasury notes and treasury bonds trade in thirty seconds. So the dealer buys at the bid, the customer sells. So if you are buying this bond, you're going to pay ninety-eight percent of par, nine hundred and eighty. And if you're selling the bond as a customer, you get the low price. Customer always pays the high price, always receives the low price. And so what you have to be able to do is turn that ninety-seven and seven eighths into a dollar price. I think the 97 is pretty easy. 97% of par is 970. And so how are you going to turn the seven eights into a price? You're going to take your calculator. You're going to take seven, divide by eight. Seven, divide by eight. And then you're going to times that by 10. I times that by 10 to find out that was 875. Why did Dean times that by 10? What did Dean times that by? I times it by a bond point, 1% of par. 1% of par is $10, and that's called a bond point, a bond point. So if the customer is selling this muni bond, the customer is gonna receive this price. If the customer is buying, they're gonna pay that price. Now, most people who buy bonds are interested in buying the bond and holding it to maturity. And so that's how we quote most bonds. Most bonds we quote on a yield and maturity basis. But uh, term bonds, if it's a term bond and you're talking to the bond desk, we're gonna quote it in price. So serial bonds are going to be quoted in yield of maturity. Term bonds are quoted in price. Very, very testable. You have to be able to distinguish between GOs and revenue bonds. You know, as I always say, maybe get a sheet of paper and fold it in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with GO bonds. And on the other, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. That's a big part of the exam. Now, I think a lot of people get hung up because they think there's a zillion types of munis. There's not. It's either geo or revenue. Now, granted, within those two categories, within those two categories, there are subcategories, if you will. So a geo bond test question is backed by taxing authority. Taxing authority. Now, as you see here, a debt security issued by a form of the government other than the federal government or agency of the federal government. What we're trying to say here is that on your exam, the states are municipal issuers. So on this exam, when they say government, they mean exclusively the U.S. government. That's what they mean, the U.S. government. They're backed by the full faith and credit. On the state level, that's primarily an income and a sales tax. You know, for most states, the general budget, the biggest uh, part of the money comes from an income tax and a sales tax. California, for example, it's an income tax. Local government, local government, you know, local government as a county is a political subdivision of the state. A city is a political subdivision of a county. You know, a school district is a political subdivision. That's just the fancy word for municipal, municipality. And those are primarily backed by ad valerum property taxes. Ad valerum is Latin for added value. So, you know, the higher your assessed valuation of your property, the more you're going to pay. You know, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. And the more civilization you want, the more you're going to have to pay. Very testable. All GO bonds require voter approval. That's very, very testable. Uh, tr well, trade confirmations are testable in this regard. Uh, you need to know that on the confirmation, we're going to disclose capacity. Uh, you need to know if it's a muni bond at a premium, we're going to quote yield to call. So there are some disclosures on 
on the confirmation, not heavily tested though. The heavily tested questions, 91 questions of the 125, 91 are on investment vehicles, not confirmations. The various investment vehicles and how they crash and burn, I'm joking, or how they get to your financial destination. So, you know, Caesar, your question was dollar cost averaging. Most people get to their financial destination using a mutual fund and dollar cost averaging than any other thing. That's the number one thing that will get you to your financial destination. And the test question there is what makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. What's the end result? You have a lower average cost than the underlying shares. Test question number three doesn't guarantee a profit. Pretty straightforward, right? So, you know, mutual funds are heavily tested. So it's the vehicles that are tested heavily. All right. So some political subdivisions have a self-imposed debt limit and some do not. You know, and as a bondholder, we would prefer they have a debt limit because that means at some point they got to recognize their problems and deal with it. Now, limited versus unlimited means limited means we're telling the bondholders that there's a limited tax we will charge our taxpayers, our citizens, our residents. Unlimited means hell or high water, whatever is necessary, we will charge. From a bondholder's perspective, I would prefer to be holding an unlimited tax bond. You know, they don't test you on mills, but if it was two mills and I didn't pay interest in principle, we go to three mills, four mills, five mills, whatever the case may be. And so that's what you would prefer as a bondholder. Now, remember, you represent the bondholders on the exam, not the issuer. Double barrel bond, two promises. Two promises, because that's what a bond is, a promise. The first promise is a user fee, as you see here from this tollway. But if the user fee is insufficient, it's the full faith and credit of the municipality. Now on the test, if I ask you about those two promises, the double barrel, right? I promise if I don't get you with the first shot, I'm gonna get you with the second shot. That is a type of GO and that would require voter approval to issue a double barrel bond. Because you know, I might say as a bondholder, how many people are gonna use the toll road when there's a freeway, a freeway to get there close by? So that we said, well, maybe we can sell the bonds if we make it double barrel. Revenue bonds, test question are backed by user fees, user fees. So anything that we can have a user fee for can be supported by a revenue bond. So here we go, right? A bridge, if you don't use the bridge, you don't pay for the bridge. Uh, we can charge people to use the park. We can charge people to use the airport. We can't have a lease payment or a lease back agreement. So what we mean here is the municipality could agree to lease the facility and the lease payments would pay interest in principle. No voter approval is required. That is testable. GOs require voter approval. Revenue bonds do not. Revenue bonds do not. The trust indenture is the written set of promises between the issuer and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholder. And they are going to torment you on, you know, type documents. You know, it's the answer set that has, you know, official statement, trust indenture, you know, notice of sale, preliminary prospectus. You know, depending on what they're asking you, it will depend on the appropriate response. So you can imagine how popular I would be as I say, if you vote for me, public transit is free. We can't do that because we promise the bondholders. We will charge a rate sufficient to pay interest in principle. Covenant is just the written promises, right? This is a written promise. We agree to insure the facility. These are promises the issuer is making to the bondholders. We promise the bondholders will maintain the facility. We uh, tell the bondholders we won't discriminate. We won't give people favorable rates if you're not spelled out in advance as uh, in the trust indenture is getting a special rate. You know, we might tell bondholders we're going to let senior citizens have a discriminatory rate in their favor, or students might have a discriminatory rate in their favor, or employees of the transit district might be able to ride for free. But if we don't fill that out or we don't spell that out, then you have to pay. And you have to pay. Lots of cash floating around. And we need to make sure the cash ends up where it's supposed to end up. And so we want to have an audit of the financial books to make sure that every, all the money is going where it's supposed to be. FBO stands for the benefit of, for the benefit of. It's a legal term. I would know that that's what that means. 
Now, as a uh, municipal finance, uh, public finance, you know, corporate finance are men and women who raise money for corporations, and public finance are men and women who raise money for municipalities. Right. So we, at Merrill Lynch, there are two types of investment banking departments at Merrill Lynch. There is an investment banking department that is corporate finance, and there's investment banking that is uh, public finance. And, you know, if I'm raising some money and bonds, I could do an open-end bond under, underwriting where I tell the mayor, I say, hey, mayor, uh, let's leave it open-end. And that means, uh, you know, we can come back and issue additional bonds in the future to modernize, update, expand the facility as long as we meet the additional bonds test. Or we can make it, mayor, a closed-end bond where we tell the bondholders we're not going to issue any more bonds after we make the facility operational. Key point, after we make the facility operational. So if we have cost overruns, Mayor, I can issue more bonds. You know, but once we get the uh, facility operational, no more bonds. Not testable, but open-end are typically older facilities, whereas closed-end are new, uh, typically newer facilities. Call provisions. Call provisions are advantageous to whom? The bondholder? or the issuer, who are call provisions advantageous to? The issuer. bond, that's right, the issuer, right on Erica. And in what kind of interest rate environment would that be advantageous to the issuer? Calling. Excellent, excellent. Now what prevents the issuer from calling your bonds, and this is a call, call risk, the risk you take that the issuer is gonna call the bonds away from you. Uh, is associated with that declining interest rate environment. And issuers, if they are going to call it, say, okay, well, you know, yeah, we agree that that's not a good thing that we can call it away from you. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll give you bondholders some call protection. We will agree that we will not call the bond for at least, and if we do, we'll give you so call protection consists of time and price. How long before the issuer can call the bonds and at what price? So let's say uh, Erica bought some uh, bonds that were callable. And since she has uh, bought the bonds, interest rates have declined. And the bonds have passed their call protection period. And I call Erica and I say, hey, Erica, you know those bonds you bought? She goes, Dean, I love those bonds, man. Interest rates have gone down. My bond has gone up. You know, the only thing I'm kind of worried about is they pass their call protection period. I said, well, Erica, that's definitely something you should worry about. And she goes, hey, Dean, uh, why'd you call? I said, well, they have, as you know, passed their call protection period, and they did a partial call. They didn't have enough money in the sinking fund, Erica, to call all the bonds. So they did a partial call. Erica says, well, how do they do partial calls? Test question. I say, Erica, they do it randomly or by lottery. And she says, well, gee, I always wanted my number to come up in a lottery. I go, well, you can take that off your bucket list. <laughs> but in this lottery, you're a loser. You know, call provisions always need to be disclosed with one testable exception. So the MSRB, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, says all call provisions must be disclosed with one exception. And that exception test question is the catastrophe call. The catastrophe call need not be disclosed. The catastrophe call is found in the trust indenture that we're discussing presently. And this says that if there is a catastrophe or calamity and the facility falls apart, we can use our catastrophe call and start fresh. We can call the bonds. And Eric says, well, you never told me about that. I said, well, you know, I didn't need to tell you about that. It's bad energy to be talking about natural disaster act of God stuff, right? So that's the only call provision that need not be disclosed. Some bonds have call provisions. Some bonds do not. Some bonds have put provisions. Some do not. Right now, put provisions are becoming very much more popular because people are afraid of a rising interest rate environment. So I say, Erica, I agree with you. The bond I'm offering you has a higher price and a lower yield than other bonds, but it niftily has a put provision. At the end of five years, you can put this back to the issuer 
Ooh, that'd be pretty good, particularly in a rising interest rate environment. So this is advantageous to the bondholder in a rising interest rate environment. You know, they're collecting a lot of money. You know, San Francisco airport I'm familiar with because, you know, I was involved there for many, many years. But anyways, uh, how convenient they have a Bank of America branch right there at the uh, airport. The Bank of America is the bank for San Francisco airport. And that makes it very convenient for the airport to deposit money. You know, so where is the money coming from? You know, San Francisco airport is financed with revenue bonds. They have a sign that I love. If you pull into the airport, it says your taxpayer dollars not at work. Your taxpayer dollars not at work. You're not paying for the airport. The people who are using the airport are paying for the airport. And so, you know, San Francisco airport is going to have gate fees. Uh, they're going to have uh, money from the parking structures. Uh, they're going to have uh, money from the uh, food court. Uh, they're going to have, uh, you know, lease payments from everybody who has retail stores there. And so when they go to Bank of America to deposit the money, the first fund it goes into, test question, is the operations and maintenance fund, the money we need to operate and maintain the airport. Now, once they have enough to operate and maintain the airport, then money gets transferred into debt service. The test question is which fund has priority? And you say on the test, operations and maintenance, and you always assume on the test, net revenue pledge. You always assume on the test, net revenue pledge. Now, gross revenue would be penny wise and pound foolish. Because now as a bondholder, you're saying you wanna be paid off the top. And the reason that's not smart is because, you know, so if they can pay you the interest in principle, but the airport is falling apart, that ain't gonna be bueno. So again, the test question is which fund has priority. Specific types of uh, revenue bonds. So again, subcategories. Industrial development revenue bonds are backed by corporate credit. That's testable. So, you know, we have what are called industrial development agencies. Industrial development agencies are charged with luring employers into particular cities. You know, for example, Denver, said to Schwab, if you'll come to Denver, Colorado, we'll build you an 80 acre corporate campus turnkey ready for you to occupy. All you gotta do is, you know, hire 4,000 Schwabies and, you know, start making the lease payments. So Denver is not on the hook for the bonds that finance that corporate campus. Schwab is, that's test question number one. This isn't like building a high school. So this bond does not serve a public purpose. This bond is a private activity bond. Private activity, meaning it's not, the public isn't participating. The major beneficiaries of this 80 acre campus is not citizens of Denver, it's Schwab. So before I sell that bond to you, I say, are you subject to the AMT? This is a binary test question. It's either yes or no. On the test, it's given information is what I'm telling you. And if the answer is yes, this becomes an unsuitable recommendation. You know, I'm coming to you from Las Vegas and we built the Raiders a new stadium, $2 billion, $500 million, which was public money. So there were municipal bonds issued to finance that stadium. It's a revenue bond, no voter approval was required. But uh, again, before I sell you those Allegiant Stadium bonds, I say, are you subject to the AMT? It's given information. So this is not called a private activity bond. This is a stadium. And stadiums are called public purpose non-essential. Again, the major beneficiaries of the bonds in this example are the Raiders, not you know building a high school, not building a high school. Uh, very testable. I can't imagine you're not going to run into that as a question. Uh, we were talking about these, Eric, or earlier. These are what we call sin taxes, special taxes. Special tax, keyword, not a general tax, a special tax. A special tax sold on, on alcohol sales, on tobacco, hotel. You know, you shouldn't be drinking, you shouldn't be smoking, and you should be at home. You shouldn't be in a hotel. It could be a tax on a particular business. It could be a tax, excise tax on a particular product or behavior. And we were talking about the Twinkie tax at one time. It can be a tax on gasoline. Now, the big test question about these special tax bonds 
If the special tax is insufficient, the bonds are going to default. The number one thing on revenue bonds is to understand that if revenue is insufficient, the bonds are going to default. Special assessment is against the benefited property. You know, for example, I'm coming to you here from uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I'm on the borderline of a, a community called Summerlin. And there's still, uh, you know, some raw land out here in Summerlin. You know, who knows how long it's been in a particular family. And so uh, maybe uh, I buy a thousand acres of raw land in Summerlin and I'm going to build a new development called Coyote Springs. I'm going to build a thousand acres. I'm going to build four homes an acre. I'm going to build 4,000 homes. I'm going to build, uh, you know, four bedroom homes. 4,000 homes times four. We're looking at 16,000 potential new residents with kitties who are going to need schools. And Summerlin says, Dean, we can't ask the existing residents of Summerlin to support new residents. When you sell the bonds, will you tell them they live within a special assessment district? And besides the normal property tax that everybody pays, they pay extra. Now, the test question again is about default. If the Coyote Springs development doesn't come to fruition, these bonds are going to default and there's no stickiness to the city of Summerlin. Right? All, the, all these revenue bonds, that's the biggest point. Moral obligation bonds, moral obligation bonds. You know, there's still a lot of uh, rural hospitals around the country. And it's hard for these rural hospitals to compete with big city doctors and big city hospitals. And so uh, maybe it's the John C. Fremont Hospital. And they want to issue some bonds to modernize and update their, their facility. And, you know, outside of local community, nobody knows who the John C. Fremont Hospital is. And so they go to the state legislature and they say, will you uh, give us permission to issue some moral obligation bonds? They get the legislative authority. So if you buy the bonds, they say John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District Bond Bonds, comma, a moral obligation of the state of, name your state. Now, if they default, then what happens is the state legislature takes a vote. And they say, all in favor of paying back the John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District bondholders say aye, as a legislator. All opposed say no. More no's than yeses, you get paid back. More yeses than no's, you get paid back. More no's than yeses, you do not. If you see this on the test, the process that whole process I just brought up is called legislative apportionment. And they would say, you know, a term associated with moral obligation bonds is, and you would say legislative apportionment. That's the process of taking the vote, you know, and if we pay, sequestering the money out of the uh, general budget. So that would be the test question there. Please note, it's not a GO. You know, you may or may not get paid. It's a Moral obligation. Again, two promises, but the second promise, prom, promise is maybe. Maybe. Uh, public housing authorities, national housing authority bonds are very testable. And what's testable about them is they have the full faith and credit of the United States government. This is low income housing, public housing authority bonds or national housing authority bonds. And there's no better credit quality than that. Right. So, another way to avail yourself of US government credit quality. Besides direct obligations of the U.S. Treasury, T-bills, T-notes, and T-bonds, uh, and Ginny Mays is with PHAs. If you get this question, I would expect all the following have the full faith and credit of the United States government except, and you have Ginny Mays, yep, PHAs, yep, you know, direct obligations of the U.S. Treasury, yeah, and then D will be something that doesn't, like Sally May or Fannie Mae or something like that. Analysis of municipal securities. Oh, so you can easily get 20, 20 plus questions on munis on your exam. You know, I think the three biggest areas in the 91 questions on investment vehicles are munis, options, and mutual funds. Those are the three biggest areas. Uh, analyzing GOs and revenue bonds, analyzing GOs and revenue bonds. So the attitude towards debt and taxes, one metric that would say whether they are able and willing to pay back the borrowed funds is the collection ratio. So that's of the uh, taxes due, how many have we collected? So 
If political subdivision A has a collection ratio of 90%, that means 90% of the taxes are current. If political subdivision B has a 70% collection ratio, that means 30% of the taxes are delinquent. So, you know, the higher, the better, the higher, the better. As a bondholder, I'd like to see high income per capita, full employment, a trending population that's growing, economic diversity or there a lack thereof. We'd like to have the ability to raise additional taxes. And then some communities have a self-imposed debt limit. And from a bondholder's perspective, that would be good because that means at some point you'd have to they have to stop borrowing money and deal with whatever fiscal challenges they face. We'd want a balanced budget. We'd want a balanced budget, the same money coming into the city as going out of the city. And we have a debt statement, as you see here. You have a debt statement, as you see here. As I told you, I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. Las Vegas is coterminous, coterminous with Clark County. So, you know, I'm responsible for paying taxes to two political subdivisions. Uh, Las Vegas, Clark County. I'm also responsible for paying uh, taxes to Clark County Unified School District. You know, states don't have overlapping debt because, again, states don't finance themselves with property taxes. Coterminous means living together. Well, you know, the investor might. I mean, you, 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 we don't assume the investor is looking at this. But on the test, we assume you would know these are things you would use to make analysis. Nobody's expecting you to do it. It's just the things that you need to know about this. Somebody else would typically do this. So coterminous means living together. So the definition of coterminous overlapping debt is when two or more taxing agencies share some of the same geographic boundaries are able to issue debt separately. So I just told you I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. Las Vegas is 100% coterminous with Clark County. You can't be in Las Vegas and not be in Clark County. P.S. you could be in Clark County and not be in Las Vegas. You could be in Henderson or Summerlin. You know, these are people that are looking to me to pay bills. You know, some people just live in Clark County, you know, in an unincorporated area of Clark County. You know, as I said, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. My brother's building an off-grid kind of situation on 10 acres in a place in Arizona. And there is zero infrastructure. <laughs> the taxes are very low because, you know, they're not delivering any services. Revenue bonds, a test question. We need a feasibility study. Feasibility studies are associated test question with revenue bonds. And feasibility studies is going to speak to, uh, are there competitive facilities? You know, where's the nearest competing airport? Where's the nearest competing stadium? If it's a uh, tollway, where's the nearest freeway? That kind of thing. And uh, the debt service coverage ratio. I'm not going to make you crunch it on the test, but I would ask you to recognize it goes with the immunity bond. Now, if you're getting to be a good test taker, which I know you are, Erica, based on all the work you've done, whenever you see three of a thing, what question should you stand by for? Except. Yeah, they just love that, right? And the D will be something that goes to a GO, like over a uh, coterminous or overlapping debt or something that goes to go to a revenue. Uh, could be a collection ratio. You know, I, I think the good trick here is the Sesame Street trick. All right, pre-refunding, pre-refunding or advanced refunding. So, uh, you know, if I came back and had to, you know, come out of retirement and do something for a living, I thought, well, what would be uh, some career choices for uh, Dean? I think, man, you know, public finance would be fun. I spend some time in corporate finance, but it'd be fun to raise money for municipalities. And so uh, maybe I do some homework and I call a municipality and I say, hey, listen, I see that you have some existing bonds out there that you're paying 5% on. Existing bonds you're paying 5% on. And as you know, right now, uh, you could issue new bonds at uh, 2%. And you say, well, Dean, if you did your homework, you would see that those bonds have not passed their call protection period. I said, no, no, I see they haven't passed their call protection. You know, what I think you ought to do is hire me to sell some new bonds at 2%. You know, that way, when we, uh, have the, when we get to the call date, the call date, we can call the bonds. 
And so I'll sell these new bonds for you on 2%. We'll take the money. We'll put it into an escrow account. And we'll buy slugs, state and local government securities. This isn't going to cost you any money out of pocket because we're going to invest the money at 2%. And then that way, when they pass their call protection period, we can call the bonds. None of what I just said is tested. Here comes the test question. Erica, once again, owns the existing 5% bonds. And I call her, I say, hey, Erica, you know those 5% bonds? She goes, Dean, I love them. Interest rates have gone down. Brand new ones only pay about two. Mine pays five. They haven't passed their call protection period. Can't call them even if they wanted to. I said, well, all that's true, Erica. All that's true. Uh, but what they have done is they pre-refunded your 5% bonds. They've advanced refunded. They just sold some new bonds at 2% and put the money into an escrow account. And Erica says, well, great. They, they owe me the money. They got the money. I go, yeah, your bonds are now AAA, right? Because they owe you the money and they have the money. And you say, well, Dean, why are you bothering me? This is the test point. I say, Erica, if you have bonds that have been advanced refunded, you are not going to be able to hold the existing bonds to maturity. These bonds are going to be what? Called. And so now yield to call becomes the effective yield on the bonds that are out there. And that's the test question. We must quote yield to call. By the way, we know Erica's bonds already are at a premium and should be quoted at yield to call because they wouldn't be doing this unless interest rates had gone down. All right, here's an example. Uh, Fulton County, Georgia issued 5% bonds four years ago. The bonds mature in 10 years and have three years more of call protection. That means Fulton County can't call these bonds even if they wanted to because they haven't passed the call protection period. Today's rates are 2%, but are expected to rise before the bonds are callable. What might the issue do? Well, what the issue would do is pre-refunding or advanced refunding. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sell the new bonds at 2%. Boom, there's our new bonds. We're gonna put that into an escrow account. We're gonna buy state and local government securities known as slugs. And that way, when the bonds pass their call protection period, we can call them. And that's the whole point of why we're doing this. The test question is, you quote, yield to call. Items affecting marketability. So maturity would affect your ability to uh, get the buy and sell the bonds, right? That has something to do, you know, longer term bonds are not as liquid as shorter term bonds. The coupon, the nominal yield, the block size. You know, I had a little old lady who came into my office and she had these beautiful Roosevelt Elementary School District bonds. They're beautiful in every way, except she only has five of them. And I said, oh, you know, if, if you had the normal unit of delivery, this would be a much different thing. I mean, nobody who works a bond desk at UBS or Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley wants to look at their inventory and see five bonds, even though they're beautiful. They want to see 50, 100, 200. That might be not rational, but it is what it is. So I told her, I said, listen, what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to call around and I'm going to get some quotes you know, kind of see what they are. I'm not going to tell them what the size is until I get the quotes. Then I got the quotes. And then I said, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can do a customer cross. So I call Caesar. I say, hey, Caesar, I know you buy muni bonds. I know you buy in Bob blocks of 2550, but I have kind of a unique situation here today. I have these Roosevelt Elementary School District bonds that are beautiful in every way. I don't know who sold these bonds to her because you should be able to hold them to maturity. It wouldn't be a problem, Caesar, if this little lady could hold them to maturity, but she needs the money. He goes, well, what's that got to do with me? I said, well, Caesar, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a customer cross. I'd like to take it out of her account and put it into your account. Here are the quotes that I have received. And what I think we should do is split the difference. You know, so if the quote's 98, you know, 98 and a half, I split it, boom. He goes, well, I, uh, I don't know why you're telling me. I said, well, Anytime Caesar, I act in a dual agency capacity where I'm representing the seller, the little old lady, and I'm representing you, the buyer, I need to disclose that to you because your, your interests are different, right? 
you want to pay the least amount possible. She wants the most amount of money amount possible. It's not a problem. It just needs to be disclosed. It helps, by the way, that it, you know, I didn't take a commission on either side. I could have if I wanted, but I didn't. Uh, the dollar price, refunding, we talked about that. Municipal bond insurance is testable. Some bonds have insurance and some bonds do not. You know, one of the largest municipal defaults uh, in recent times was Detroit, Michigan. And so, you know, Caesar has some Detroit, Michigan bonds and he calls me, he goes, God, Dean, tell me my bonds are insured. I said, well, Caesar, you are indeed correct. Some of the Detroit, Michigan bonds have credit enhancement, are insured, some or not. What is the QCIP on your bonds? You don't need to know QCIP stands for Committee on Uniform Security Identification Procedure Number, thank God. But you do need to know that every security has its own unique identifying number. And if it has the insurance, that would be printed on the bond certificate, but unlikely that, you know, my friend Caesar has this on there. So I punch it up, I say, hey, Caesar, good news, the bonds you own are insured. Test question number one. Some bonds have insurance, some bonds do not. And the insurance company has agreed to continue, Caesar, to pay you the timely payment of interest in principle. He goes, well, Dean, what's the price? I said, well, before I tell you the price, Caesar, I want you to understand something. They don't insure the price. Only The only thing they insure is interest in principle. Not you know what you can get for the bond in the secondary market. So that's kind of a trick question on the exam about what do or do they not insure? Municipal bond math. Woo! Woo! So uh, this is about fifty percent probability, Erica, that you're going to receive this on your test. You know, this is a dean term; it's not a test term. But I like to think of straight line amortization upward as accretion that is a test term. And I like to think of straight line amortization downward as decretion, accrete and decrete. When you buy a muni bond at a premium, I debate whether I should even show you this because if you start trying to decrete everything you bump into, you're gonna get more questions wrong than you're going to get right. And so if you buy a muni bond at a premium, you don't get to decide how to set that up on your tax return. So the IRS thinks I don't take my last buck and buy a muni bond. The IRS thinks that if Dean buys a muni bond, he's got other investments. That's a good assumption and that's true. And they say, Dean, we think what you would like to do is buy like a block of uh, muni bonds for 120 on 20% of par, 120 grand, and uh, take that $20,000 loss in one fell swoop whenever it's convenient for you. I go, that's exactly what I want to do. And I say, no, 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 no. You have to take the loss, Dean, and little itty bitty hits along the way. That's going to prevent me from sheltering my other investments. So I don't get to decide how to set this up on my tax return. So here is very much the test question. It'll look very much like what I have it here on the screen. An investor purchased a municipal bond for 1120 with 12 years to maturity. So the first thing we have to be able to do is recognize that indeed, this is a muni bond purchased at a premium. Right? So that's our first thing we gotta recognize. So I said, ah, this is gonna be that straight line amortization down thing called decretion. So after holding the bond for six years, the investor sells the bond for 1,030. What is the investor's gain or loss? All right, so now let's set this up. Let's set this up. We paid 1,120. We're getting back 1,000. So we're losing $120 over 10, uh, 12 years. So we're losing $10. That's the amount that I'm gonna have to decrete each year. Again, 50% probability I'm gonna have to do this. Now, as you recall, the question said that we've held it for six years. So if we've been writing down $10, for six years, our adjusted cost base is 1,060, right? That's what our adjusted cost base is. And then it says we sell for 1,030. 
So if our adjusted cost base is 1,060 and we sell for 1,030, it looks like we have a $30 loss. Right now, people who miss this completely are gonna get this uh, wrong, right? So this is called straight line amortization downward. So let's review 50% probability. You're gonna have to do this on your series. So, and so let's go boom, let's reset. So the first thing we have to recognize is that it is a muni bond purchased at a premium. It is a muni bond purchased at a premium. Now I wanna let me reset it, let's boom. Oh, I see what I had to do. Boom, 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 there we go. So here's our test question. An investor purchased a muni bond for 1,120. We said, ah, muni bond at a premium, 12 years to maturity. We've held it for six. We sell for 103. So I go, okay, I'm losing $120 over 10 years. I've had it for six. That's my adjusted cost base. I sell for 1,030, $30 loss. OID is you have to do accretion. I'm not going to have to make you do accretion, but the trick here is that this is a muni bond. And so that increased amount, that imputed interest is tax-free. That imputed interest is tax-free. Tax calculations. The number one reason that people buy muni bonds is because the interest they pay is federally tax exempt. Be careful, state and local depends on where you live and what kind of bond you're going to buy. If you're a California resident and you buy a Nevada bond, California can and will tax you. So you say, Dean, are there any bonds that no matter where I live in the United States of America would be exempt at all levels? And I say, yeah, territories of the United States government. Do we need to review them? We do not. They're not gonna give you anything other than Puerto Rico. They're not gonna give you US Micronesia. They're not gonna give you American Samoa. They're not going to give you the US Virgin Islands. They're going to give you Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. So this is very testable in terms of suitability. You know, whether somebody should buy a muni or whether they should buy a municipal bond. The higher your tax bracket, the more attractive a muni is going to be. So if you get 10% in a corporate bond, that's $100. But you don't get to keep the $100, right? That's not your take home pay because you got to pay taxes. And so we got to take that into account and say, I say, Eric, on your tax bracket, when you get $100, 10% on a corporate bond, you have to kick back to the government 40. So what we are left with after tax is 60. That is your effective yield on a corporate bond paying 10 when you're in a 40% tax bracket. Or I say, if we can get you 6% tax free, that 6% is the nominal yield, and you don't have to pay taxes, the effective yield is six. So what we're saying here is that when you buy a 10% corporate bond at a 40% tax bracket, or you buy a 6% muni, that both of those things are the same. That is the same yield. By the way, on the test, it wouldn't be the same. You'd have to make a decision about whether the customer should buy the muni or the corporate. So let's look at that testable scenario. Let's look at that testable scenario. So here we're asking you on the test whether your customer should buy a corporate bond paying eight or a muni bond paying five. And they tell you the investors in a 20% tax bracket. So you're either gonna multiply or divide depending on what you're being asked. If you're being asked the tax-free equivalent, if what you're given first is the taxable yield, you're going to multiply. And whenever they give you the tax bracket, you have to do the parentheses first. So I say, Erica, in a 20% tax bracket, when you get a dollar, you can either you think of this as one, or when you get 100 cents, that's a dollar as well, you only get to keep 80% of the dollar or 80 cents. The rest of it, remember, is your tax obligation. So in your to bracket, your bracket of 20, getting eight after you pay taxes leaves you with 6.4. So the point again, Erica, is if I can't find a muni bond that pays better than 6.4, you should buy the corporate bond. You should buy the corporate bond. Now, the other version of this is to do tax-free and go the other direction. And this is where we divide. 
So I say, Eric, on your tax bracket, getting 5% and not paying taxes is the equivalent of getting six and a quarter. Now, a test taking trick, you know, you know, Erica, you were in fire on some of our test taking tricks earlier. And, you know, uh, I'm not so sure how many more test taking tricks we want to add to your quiver, error to your quiver. But one thing you should know is that if I start with the taxable, the number I'm looking for is always going to be a lower number. So if they give me the taxable yield, I could just eliminate any answer set, anything that isn't less than eight. That alone will sometimes give you a 50 50. And another kind of test taking trick is once they give me the tax free, I know going the other direction, it's going to be a higher number. So that'll give me a 50-50 as uh, well. Well, the MSRB ultimately decides what is a municipal security. And uh, if the MSRB says a 529 is a municipal security, well, then it's a municipal security. So 529 state-sponsored municipal fund securities are municipal securities. And you know what they're going to ask you about, you are going to get a couple of 529 questions. Usually it's about con contrasting a 529 with a Coverdale, but the contributions to a 529 are made after tax. The distributions, woo, are tax-free for qualified educational expenses. You can set them up in more than one state. Uh, they offer you tax-deferred growth. They're the property of the donor, but not part of the donor's estate, which is kind of cool. I mean, you know, we can use this to take money out of the donor's estate. The gift tax rules apply. So what you can do is front load these things for five years without running afoul of the gift tax. And then typically it's put in a pooled account, a mutual fund. A pooled account is just a mutual fund. And then that's why you have the investment risk. Uh, prepaid tuition plans. Uh, contributions are after tax. They're set up in the state of residence. They can be transferred to other schools, other states, and they offer inflation protection. I doubt I'm going to do this. I mean, you know, you know, Uncle Dean would really have to have a good day for me to do this. But my nephew, I kind of uh, like him a lot. We're going to his 16th birthday party. And, uh, you know, smart young man. He's into robotics. And, you know, he's always calling me about my channel. And he thinks I should uh, start doing, you know, investment stuff for kids. And I said, that's not what the channel's about. But God bless him. You know, and uh, maybe I decide, uh, you know, I'm going to buy him a prepaid tuition. I'm just going to buy him a bachelor's degree. Boom, here you go. This is a bachelor's degree. Now that's inflation protection because again, I don't have to worry about whatever that costs because the university has agreed to deliver that. You know, by the way, if, you know, I would have all my eggs in my, my West basket, but good news, you know, other kids in the family, you know, so if he doesn't quite work out, I'm joking, but you know, <laughs> we're diversified, right? We, we got more kids that we uh, <laughs> can bet on. Again, if the MSRB says it's a municipal security, it's a municipal security. So this is the muni equivalent of a money market fund where the cities and counties, the local governments kind of put all their money into a common pooled account where they can get at least some kind of return on their short term uh, money by buying money market securities, uh, commercial paper, bankers acceptances, uh, negotiable jumbo CDs, uh, T-bills. And again, it is the equivalent of a money market fund. So it's at a net asset value a dollar. And as I say, they, you know, this is what's used to like pay the payroll of the policemen and the firemen and the, the teachers and all that kind of stuff. Well, immunities are exempt. That's very testable. So, you know, if I want to sell brand new municipals, I don't need to register with the SEC. So the state administrator or the SEC says, Dean, were you selling brand new securities to the public and you didn't make a registration statement? I say I was. Uh, it was an exempt issue or it was a municipal security. And so municipal securities do not use prospectuses. Municipal securities don't use prospectuses. They have other disclosure documents. The main one would be an official statement. Uh, who buys shares in the local government investment pool? Local governments, cities, counties, school districts. It's where they buy, just like a mutual fund, money market fund, they're buying shares in the local government investment pool. So that's who buys it. It's uh, the government uh, entities that are buying a shares in the local government investment pool and they buy it to get some return on their money. So maybe we're not a part of the local government investment pool here in Clark County. You know, maybe we live, I don't know, we're in uh, Charleston is a, a community in the uh, mountains from here in Nevada. And I am a Charleston uh, treasurer in the city. I say, hey, why don't we participate in the local government investment pool 
uh, down in Las Vegas and park our idle cash there and get some kind of a return. Right? And then the you know, city council would vote whether they don't want to participate or not. ABLE accounts, the only thing uh, people tell me, again, MSRB says ABLE accounts are municipal fund securities. So these are tax advantage savings for uh, the disabled. It's This is kind of a replay of your SIE. The beneficiaries, the account owner, the income earned is not taxed. The 26 is what people tell me they see on debrief, is to understand that that 26 is the key to whether or not they're going to be able to have an ABLE account. You're automatically eligible for an ABLE account if you meet the age onset, 26, or if you're already receiving you know, either state social security or federal social security disability. Contributions are made by any person and the contributions are made with after-tax dollars. MSRB rules, very testable, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. They publish rules, but they're denied the enjoyment of enforcement. All they do is publish rules. And so, that leads us to our first test question. I just told you there's nobody has uh, at the MSRB who has enforcement power. So who enforces MSRB rules on a bank exclusively conducting a municipal business? The same people that always enforce rules on banks. The FDIC, the Federal Reserve Board, the Comptroller of Currency. Who enforces MSRB rules on broker dealers? The same people that always enforce rules on broker dealers. FINRA and the SEC. Now, it's not whose rule it is. It's not whose rule it is. It's do you know the rules? So on a customer confirmation, we need the name of the customer, right? Or the name of the financial institution here, the address of the financial institution, the telephone number. If it's a bank, you know, same thing. I wish other businesses were like ours. I hate it when I get a receipt and it doesn't have contact information. The customer is where they bought or sold. A detailed description of the security. I told you QSIP is a test question. Let's say each security has its own unique identifying number known as, and you got to come up with a QSIP. You got to come up with a QSIP. The trade date is on there. The trade date, remember, is when we agree to terms. The settlement was ownership changes hands. And what is that for corporates and munis? What is settlement for corporates and munis? Very testable. <laughs> That's right, T plus two, right? T plus two, very testable. Okay, so this is very testable as well. Which one of those teeter-totters would we be most interested in as a test taker? It is this one, right? When you buy a muni bond at a premium, when you buy a muni bond at a premium, you must quote to the customer, very testable, the yield to call. That is very testable because that's the lowest. You, after knowing that, you still may want it, but you can't make that decision without knowing that. As we said, the MSRB requires that all call provisions be disclosed and they would be disclosed on the confirmation. Do you remember the only exception? What was the only exception to the MSRB rule about quoting yield to call? What was the only call provision I need not disclose to the a- or calamity. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? The catastrophe call is the only one. All right, so I got a couple of uh, performance opportunities for you. Which of the following callable municipal bonds must the yield to call be recorded on the confirmation? So what I'm asking you in this question is to recognize which one of these bonds is at a premium. So which one do you think it is? Excellent, excellent, right? The way you should do this is with your, your teeter-totter. Here's our teeter-totter, we teeter right? We draw a flat line, which represents a bond at par, right? There's our flat line. And then we know that the thing that doesn't change is the coupon, right? So I literally, by the way, this one, eight and eight is par, right? Basis is the fancy word for yield of maturity. So here I have a basis of seven and I have a nominal yield of nine. And so that is indeed the bond at a premium. Very testable. Accrued interest is paid by whom to whom? Who pays the accrued interest on a bond? The buyer or the seller? 
That's right. And it's calculated, remember, the accrued interest from the last time the bonds paid interest up to but not including settlement. Up to but not including settlement. We always disclose capacity on the confirmation. So if we act as your agent, that means on your behalf, we got the bond from another broker dealer. It says agent on your confirmation. It does not say who the counterparty is, but you're allowed to call and say, Dean, who's the other side of the trade? That's what the counterparty is, the other side. Now you're confused if it says we acted as a principal and you call me and say, who's the other side? I say, well, you're a little confused. We're trading from inventory. So you, you bought it from our inventory. I had a, I had a young lady in a, who knows if I remember going to get to each live classes again, but we were going over muni bonds and she uh, brought in a recommendation that her bond desk had made to one of their customers. And, you know, she was showing it to me and, uh, you know, she was all excited and she's saying my bond desk was so helpful and I didn't want to kind of burst her bubble. I, I, but I was tempted to say, well, yeah, they're helpful because if that client buys all those bonds, it's going to be a good day on the bond desk, right? <laughs> so nothing wrong with trading from principal, but that would have been a, a pretty uh, decent markup day, right? If this client buys all those bonds from us. So here's uh, just uh, some helpful kind of ways to remember this relationship or what we call capacity, right? So brokers act as agents for commissions. A good way to be, remember that is A, B, C, D, agency, broker, commission, and it's disclosed. Uh, another way is brokers act as agents for commissions. Now in secondary transactions, that's true. In primary transactions, this would be, for example, a best efforts underwriting. We're talking about prime, uh, secondary transactions, but in banking, it would be primary. And then we see on the other side, we have dealers act as principals for profits. So dip them, dealer, inventory, principal, markup, or markdown. Uh, I like to think it as dealers act for as principals for profits. If it's a banking deal, that would be an example would be firm commitment underwriting. Other information that applies, the dated dates start to accrue interest for the time frame. We did one of these, Eric, our earlier, right, where we had uh, a January 1, but it didn't make that first coupon until August 1st. So the dated date was January 1st when it started to accrue interest. And that's a long time frame, more than the six. That first coupon is typically longer than the six months. Uh, what has been called pre or refunded, very testable. You need to know what a legal opinion is, who does it, the bond council. You need to know uh, what they're going to opine about. You know, legislative authority, exempt from 33, ex um, uh, legislative authority, uh, they're federally tax exempt. And it'll be qualified or unqualified. What would be better, qualified or unqualified? Unqualified. Yeah, without reservations, right? Now, over the years, some bonds have lost their legal opinions and trade what we call X legal without the coupon, without the coupon. Now, the MSRB doesn't have a 5% policy like FINRA. FINRA has a 5% policy. The MSRB says, we don't have a policy. Whatever you're charging, though, it should be fair and reasonable. You know, we should never be unfair and unreasonable about anything. So whether we charge a markup or markdown, it should be fair and reasonable. If we charge a commission, it should be fair and reasonable. We should never be unfair and unreasonable. Relevant factors, fair value of the bonds, the dollar amount of the trade, the availability of securities, it's the exact same as the 5% policy. It's just not 5%. The execution ex expense, the value of the services, and yeah, the dealer's entitled to a profit. So I don't have to do things at a loss, right? I'm entitled to make a profit. Very testable. Suitability. I say for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. The more I know about you, the better I can be determine suitability and make appropriate recommendations. You say, well, Dean, it's not your damn business. I go, unfortunately, it is. You know, all my regulators have a KYC rule. KYC stands for know your customer. You know, we're not supposed to do business with people who we don't know who they are. Right? Huge, know your tax status. Right? Because I need to know whether, you're, you know, you're in an uncomfortably high tax bracket. Munis might be appropriate or you're not. Investment objectives, we're not supposed to recommend unsuitable trades and churning is a big no. -no. Churning are trades that are excessive in size and frequency. Control relationships need to be disclosed. 
So, you know, my firm was called Gamma Global. So there's my sign out there, Gamma Global Broker Dealer. And so I sit on the city council and the city council goes to sell some bonds. I go, hey, that's what I do for a living. And why don't you hire my team at Gamma Global to sell the bonds? And so, you know, my guy rep calls you and says, hey, uh, we got these bonds. And you go, do you like the bonds? We go, we love the bonds. Our CEO uh, represents the issue of the city and he represents our broker dealer. There's a control relationship. So it needs to be disclosed. By the way, that's the same with Merrill Lynch and Bank of America, right? It's not only munis, it's any control relationship, any control relationship. We're talking munis, but if it's Merrill Lynch and you buy Bank of America stock on your com firm, it'll say there's a control relationship. If I'm a Merrill broker and I go to buy you Bank of America stock, you say, well, Dean, you have discretionary authority. I don't know why you're bothering me. I say, I can't use it because there's a control relationship. So control relationships need to be disclosed. Record keeping, uh, lifetime records of a broker dealer are the corporate articles and the minutes of the board's meetings. Very few records are six. The vast majority of brokerage firm records are three. Now, one that people tell me shows up on their exam in terms of debrief is this thing about when we cut, close the customer account. You know, it's a six-year record from account closure. MSRB is a, a six-year record, but FINRA is four. The one you're going to see on the test is FINRA that is four. Very testable, a maximum gift or gratuity rule that one employee can give the employee of another firm is $100, very testable. Doesn't count normal deductible business activities. Does not count reminder advertising. Financial advisors can't switch their role. So, you know, if I'm uh, acting as a financial advisor to the city, I say my recommendation is you put it out to bid and see who can provide you with the lowest net interest cost. They say, well, Dean, we love your firm. Can't you do that? I say, no. The MSRB prohibits me from switching my role. They think it's too much of a conflict of interest for my firm to represent you, the issuer, represent my firm, and then represent my clients all in one transaction. So no can do. Now, I can remain as your financial advisor, help you prepare documents, uh, help you evaluate bids that are going to be submitted. I can do that kind of thing for you. All right. Well, I went pretty quick because I went to try and get that all done for you, Erica. So you uh, got the entire Muni lecture, even though I went a little faster than I normally would to get that done. Uh, Caesar, for your dollar cost averaging, I gave you the answer for it. Fixed dollars invested regularly, lower average cost, the underlying shares, not guarantee a profit. In the next session, you see me in either live, time, live stream uh, Q&A, the live stream overtime session, or the next office hour, I, I can go into a little more uh, depth on that. Anything else you want to know before we end this uh, free office hour? No, I guess the biggest thing is just to be able to see it, see how okay. the dollar so we'll, cost we'll do that, works. Caesar. Uh, just uh, like I say, just uh, remind me that you already are in the queue before you get there, and so we'll allow you to front run. Front. Run. Uh, uh, yeah. What is uh, Caesar? When's your test date? Actually, I go into the to the uh, cave on Monday. On the oh, okay. Well, well, I guess what we probably should do it then. I guess let's do it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be, you know, you may not, we may not see each other before you go to slay the dragon, right? Yeah. Uh, is my whiteboard up? Yes. So this is testable for you as well, Erica. So, so test question number one, I told you, you have to give me fixed dollars invested regularly, right? So this customer agrees to give me a hundred dollars every quarter. And the reason this works is because you're doing exactly what you should be doing, which is buying more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. So let's say uh, when you give me this $100, the public offering price is five. Let's say now it's 10. Uh, let's say now it's uh, 10. And now let's say it's five. Now on a bad draw, you might actually have to do the math. And so here we got to figure out how many shares we're going to get. We're going to get 20 shares. And now we're going to get 10 shares. As I said, what's kind of cool is we're doing exactly what we should be doing, which is loading up when it's cheap and cutting back when it's high. Boom. And now I'm going to illustrate the second part of what I told you is testable. The first test question, remember, is what makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. Test question number two is the share price, the average share price. So again, if we're gonna to have to do the math here, we take the five, the 10, the 10, the 15, that's 30. 
and we divide by four, and we find out that the average share price was 750. And remember I said the end result is you're gonna end up with a lower average cost than the average price. So that's our average price. Boom. Okay, so now let's see how many shares you got. So you spent $400 and you had purchased 60 shares. And so if we take that uh, $400 and divide by the 60 shares, let's go smaller font. Uh, let's put it over here. Oh, we can put it bigger than that. Boom. Uh, and again, I'm terrible at arithmetic, so I'm going to get my calculator. 400 divided by 60. And we end up with a share price of 666. That is our average cost. And I told you that's test question number two. We end up with a lower average cost than the average share price. That's test question number two. Do you remember the last test question? It doesn't guarantee a profit. Right now, Caesar, you have 60 shares at five. This, this account is worth $300. Right, so you can't guarantee a profit. Now, outside of Series 7 Fantasyland, good news, you know, you guys get to leave. I'm stuck here permanently in Series 7 Fantasyland. I never get to leave. No wonder I'm demented. <laughs> uh, but outside of Series 7 Fantasyland, you'd be hard-pressed to convince me that if anybody's investing long-term using dollar cost averaging, that they wouldn't be okay. Remember that third test question is, it doesn't guarantee a profit. I'd give you an example here as somebody who's lost 25% of their principal uh, dollar cost averaging. Okay, so there you go. Anything else uh, before Monday? Because who knows if I'll see you before Monday, Caesar. Anything else you need to worry or worried about? No. Hey, Erica, how about you? Anything else? Uh, Market Maker Floor Broker is testable, Erica. Floor Brokers execute orders for clients of member firms. And the Floor Broker, Erica, remember, is the one holding a not held order where the floor broker can make a decision about time and price without discretionary authority. And then market makers, you will be tested on the bid and the ask and the spread and, you know, uh, you know, backing away, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's testable. It's not as testable as the other stuff, but it's testable. All right. Anything else? Okay. So I'm not so sure this was an office hour or if this is more like a tutoring session. So <laughs> you know, maybe I'll, maybe I don't mind. Like I say, I don't mind uh, that it ended up being more of a, you know, tutoring session. But I think what I will do, maybe we'll just put it in the tutoring replay rather than in the, um, the coaching or office hour replay. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So just keep working. I know you're grinding. So just keep grinding. Uh, I told you, I'm very pleased with what you do know. What you do know, you know well. And that is really going to be good. I don't think there's any major holes. Uh, and, you know, as I said, you got to be careful with uh, whether it's Friday or Monday. You got to be careful that you're, you know, matriculating down the field into scoring position. You're not going backwards. So anything that may cause you to go backwards, you just got to let it go at this point. Okay, guys, uh, let me know what happens. And if you need me between now and then, you know where to find me. Appreciate it, Mr. T. Okay, you bet. Bye-bye. Yep, yep. Oh.